This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. Welcome to the City of God podcast, where we are weekly talking about today's biggest cultural issues all through the lens of God's infallible word. My name is Rob Pacienza, and as always, joined by my co-host, John Rabe. Great to see you today, buddy. Great to see you today, Rob. We've got another terrific show planned today. Of course, this podcast is called The City of God, and we didn't just make that up. That is, uh, for those who don't know, the title of one of the true classics of not only Christianity, but really of Western civilization, and that is St. Augustine's book by that name, The City of God. And uh, it, it was written at a time when you had the, the Roman Empire crumbling, and uh, there were questions about the Christian's relationship to that and to the state. And so today on this program, we're going to dig into that book and discover why it's extraordinarily relevant to us as Christians today. Absolutely. And our guest is Dr. Michael Allen. Uh, Mike Allen is a good friend of mine. I grew up with Mike, uh, but he is currently the professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, as well as the dean of academics there on that campus. Uh, grew up here in South Florida, but is now serving in the Orlando area. We uh, do that deep dive into this classic book, which by the way, is still recognized by some secular universities as a classic, which yeah. is amazing to, to your point, not just recognizing Christian circles, but throughout all of academia as one of the classics throughout, you know, uh, th throughout history. We sort of have a tendency to, uh, in our day, what we have what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, which is newer is better. Sure. If a book has hung around for 1,500 years, which is the case at this point with Augustine's City of God, that means that there's something there. Yeah. And, and Augustine is probably the greatest mind in church history once you go, come past Jesus and the apostles themselves. So with Mike Allen, we do a deep dive, as we said, into the City of God. We talk about there being two distinct worldviews mm -hmm. uh, that Augustine... Um, hundreds of years ago unpacks for us the worldview of the city of God versus the worldview of the city of man, and then take it a step further in our interview. How in the world does this apply today? And, and it really does. And to your point, that's why we named this podcast, The City of God. We are still on this pilgrimage, on this journey, advancing the city of God, its virtues and its values in the midst of the city of man. And hopefully our audience will see how uh, hundreds of years later, we are still engaging culture uh, for the sake of the city of God, uh, that there are virtues and values that God has entrusted to us as his people. And we want our regions, wherever you're watching uh, this podcast, we want our regions, our communities to look more and more like the city of God and less like the city of man. Amen. Um, and, and Michael, Allen is a, just a brilliant guy. You gave his credentials, uh, but also a, a brilliant theologian. John, we're privileged to have with us Mike Allen uh, here on the City of God podcast today. Mike, welcome. Oh, so good to be with you guys. We have a, a theological professor, another person to make me feel uh, intellectually and theologically inferior, not, of course, by your own, uh, not because of anything you're doing, but you, we, we've had some very learned men come through here, and I learn something every time. And uh, and it's exciting to have Mike here, because in addition to being a uh, professor of systematic Theology at Reformed Theological Seminary up in the Orlando area. Uh, and acad academic dean. And academic dean uh, yep. has a background here. Uh, yep. He's coming through Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church and Knox Theological Seminary. So a lot of connections there. Absolutely. A former professor at Knox Seminary, but uh, most importantly, uh, was my partner in crime in the youth ministry internship. Uh -huh. That's right. In the summer of maybe 2000. I think it was 2001. 2001. We've still got to claim it as being in this century and millennium. Yes. <laughs> yeah, can't, that's right. can't push it too far back, but the previous, uh, yeah, the twentieth century is my millennium. So <laughs> you guys come along late. But it's but so good to be back. So good to be back. Um, and Mike, this podcast, as you know, is called the City of God Podcast. Augustine wrote the book, uh, The City of God. Uh, tell us a little bit about the premise of that book. Yeah. So in August, the year four ten, King Alaric king of the Goths, brought an army and laid siege to the city of Rome, and for a weekend conquered Rome. Uh, this was shocking. Rome had taken on the name the Eternal City. It had had an 
thousand year reign. Mm -hmm. And though only a small part of the empire was harmed, and even though only a portion of the city actually directly experienced this attack, the event punctured the expectation of security, of peace, of dominance all around the Roman Empire. And questions arose, who's to blame? How'd this happen? And as it happens, Christians had been reigning for just over a generation. A century ago, Constantine had converted, but really just a, a generation prior, King, uh, Emperor Theodosius had begun to actually legislate pretty assertively on Christian grounds. And so people started to say, it's the Christian's fault. We'd, we'd enjoyed such prosperity and security for a millennium. The Christians take over and what do you know, almost right away, we start losing battles. And Augustine writes the city of God to offer counsel to a friend who wants to know, how do we respond to those charges? How do we engage apologetically, both with appropriate claims about what's fair and what's right, but also not sort of assuming the state of the question, but actually challenging those who might criticize Christianity and arguing for a positive place for Christians in society. And we talk about that and, and you lay out the historical context. We're going back, what, 1,500 years. Uh, it, it would be easy to listen to that and say, oh, well, okay, that's sort of of, of minor historical uh, interest for people who are into that sort of thing. But the, the reason this podcast is called The City of God, the reason that we're talking about this 1,500 years later is that what Augustine is dealing with there and uh, it, what what the issues are that are presented through that are eternally relevant and they're extraordinarily relevant to us today right in our situation, aren't they? Yeah, in, in addressing the situation there and specifically Roman problems, Augustine isn't satisfied to talk about just the latest controversy or problem. He makes a point not only of responding to the charges at hand, but then of preventing, presenting a Christian and scriptural way of perceiving what's going on in the world. And he actually tells the whole story of the entire Bible in doing so. And, and that gives... Christian and non-Christian readers, a set of lenses to understand what would be a biblical view of world history? What would be a biblical view of the rising and falling of societies? What would be a biblical understanding of, of how Christian women and men are to contribute as citizens, perhaps even at times as rulers? Um, it presents all those things, and those are all things that Christians through the ages on every continent have found pertinent whatever the situation or circumstance may be. Yeah. So it, really, I mean, it, it's a difference between two worldviews, uh, the worldview that presents the city of God and the worldview of the city of man. Can, it, how, how are those two worldviews un, unpacked and contrasted in this great work? Yeah. Augustine does present this, this dichotomy and it's crucial to catch. It is a dichotomy. You're a member of mm -hmm. one or the other. And he sees this emerging from the Bible as early as the book of Genesis. And, and he defines membership or citizenship in one or the other city as defined by what you love, not just what you do, mm. not simply what you think or what you cheer for, but ultimately what you love. He says the city of God is defined by the love for God, even to the contempt of man. The city of man is defined by the love for man or humanity, even to the contempt of God. So it's ultimately about what gets your greatest allegiance, what has your greatest desire, what is your highest and most ultimate love. And Augustine goes on to talk about the nature of love there in a way that I think is so vivid. It's so clarifying. It explains the kind of tensions we see in the world and even in ourselves. He describes how in the city of man, those of us who are sinners, even those of us as Christians, as, as much as we have the old self, we can still identify with this, mm -hmm. that there's what he calls on page one, the libido dominandi, this lust to dominate. We want to be in control. We want to play God. We see that's the temptation there in Genesis 3 that they give into this desire to have a good thing on our own timing in our own manner or way, even when God warns against it. And Augustine argues that sadly, what we see in both personal and public tragedy is that that lust to dominate or to be in control, it winds up being a lust that dominates us because you can never guarantee that there won't be opponents and threats. You can never guarantee eternal security and have, you are constantly on the clock if you are going to play God. And he describes psychologically how that's consuming, mm. 
It, it leads to depression. It leads to great angst and pain. He describes publicly how that leads to breakdown. He describes the household, the marriage, the family, how that leads to remarkable antipathy and selfishness. It provides a remarkable picture for us to say the Bible gives us so much by way of a solution, of course, in Jesus. But first, the Bible, Augustine helps us here, the Bible describes the nature of our problem, living amongst the city of man, being born in sin as citizens in the city of man, and and really struggling, trying to play God and and being plagued for it. You bring up a number of things there that I think are really helpful and really important to this discussion because uh, Augustine's City of God is regarded by many as a foundation stone in political theology, and it is that. But as you're speaking about what Augustine is saying there, what I realize is that we don't so neatly separate those things out. Well, here's personal spirituality here. Here's political theology over here. And so often, I think we evangelicals do that. We cut one off or the other. So either we retreat into, you know, personal spirituality, pietism, or we run the other way and everything becomes political. Uh, Augustine in his own life was someone who was intimately familiar with these sinful drives and how they affected everything in his life and and how the goodness of God could move him past those things. Uh, Tell me a little bit about this this integration that we find in him and what we can learn from it between the the political and the the personal spiritual life. Yeah, he does have things to say about politics and society. He doesn't offer a political theory. That's mm-hmm. not the point of this. And that's not his training or vocation, of course, though it matters much. He's looking at at persons. And as you said, John, persons as wholes, we are creatures made by God. We're creatures made good by God. We're creatures made by God with purpose and vocation. And tragically, sin, as we commit it, as we experience it in Adam, sin eats away like a parasite at every facet of our being. And so we go wayward and disordered. And that doesn't get located simply in the mind or in our appetites. It's not simply present at home or when we go out into the marketplace. It really does parasitically eat away and plague every facet of our lives. And so the the solution has to be just as holistic as that problem. And Augustine argues that's why you've got to talk about loves, not simple technique, not simple theory, not strategy, not simple belief, but really at the core of all of those things and underneath them, this idea of of the biblical heart, which we often hear as sort of fleeting feelings, Mm -hmm. but but in the Bible is actually the very core of your being, Mm -hmm. including the intellect, uh, the feeling or affection, the will, everything that makes you who you are in public and in private. And Augustine argues you've got to talk about resurrection and transformation because because sin in its parasitic disorder, it, it does everything from make you incapable of controlling your body uh, in the way that you might like, um, to it makes you incapable of actually controlling your household or your words. How many of us know just as much as we can't do physically what we used to do or what we think we ideally sure. ought to do, <laughs> so often we find ourselves in conversation and we find, as Paul says, that the thing I know I want to say, I don't, and the thing I should say, you know, I, I, I don't. So, I mean, there's, there's just this candor, isn't there, and an honesty about all the many ways in which we need grace to shape us from the, the inmost core. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. that, As they say, history repeats itself. Um, We once again find ourselves in the 21st century in a polarized society, everybody pointing their finger at each other, doomsday scenarios, uh, world going to hell in a handbasket mentality. And the church is uh, just as guilty at kind of playing into kind of the cultural narrative from the mainstream media and social media. How does the thesis of the city of God in the fifth century help inform kind of what is happening today in our cultural moment? Uh, There are so many smaller things that are worth exploring, but one big idea I would convey is Augustine doesn't just address the immediate question, 
He does that for 250 pages, but then he offers a longer <laughs> second part where he says, but that question isn't the most interesting. The more interesting question is your question, Rob. How do we have a Christian approach to this? Not just how do we respond to the naysayers and the critics, but, but what's true and good and beautiful according to Jesus and the Bible. And Augustine there tells the story of the beginning the uh, journey and the end of these two cities. And, and one way to sum all that up would be to say, we've got to know that we're on a pilgrimage. Yeah. We are no longer as Christians in Egypt. We have been freed from that bondage, but we're not yet to Canaan. This is not the fair and happy shores yet, though yeah. we taste that bit by bit. Yeah. And we need to appreciate, therefore, what's involved in being sojourners and yeah. pilgrims, being the city of God dwelling in the midst of the city of man. So he emphasizes, we are not citizens of the city of man, but we have vested interest in the city of man. And we want to welcome those from the city of man into the city of God. And so we dwell amidst it. And that changes your posture. It changes your posture on the one hand, knowing that the world has been plagued by sin. You're grateful for God's common grace. You're thankful where you see that things could be worse, where remarkable gifts are to be found even beyond the family of God. On the other hand, you're honest and repentant about where even you as a member of the city of God are now. We have not yet arrived. We've not yet been glorified. We still need to repent forward. And God has grace for the church day by day on that front. Um, and so there, there's a remarkable way of providing, I think, both hope as well as candor. And some of us struggle perhaps more with one or the other dispositionally. And certainly all of us can be overwhelmed by the need for one or another in different seasons of life. But in so many ways, isn't that really what all of us need? We need at times to be given hope that comforts, that buoys us to know that though it's hard, though there are dark seasons, though there are difficult failings out there and in here, God is clearly working his resurrection work in his kingdom and he shall bring it to fruition. At other times, we need to be sobered up with the candid word that it's not just them, it's also us. And we need to be honest about temptation before us. We need to be repentant about failures within us. And that's crucial if we're to, to honor God's grace and rely on it more. Yeah, and I think the problem is we're just not willing. I hear what you what you just described as the great tension yeah. of the present age, the in-between times. Already and, and the not yet. Yeah, right. and Christians just are not, many of them, not willing to embrace that tension that gives us both, on the one hand, great hope, uh, but also frees us to say, yeah, that it is not the way it should be. And we should not look at this world through rose colored glasses, but see it for what it is. But how can we be the hopeful presence in the midst of this time in, in between the mm -hmm. Jesus coming in grace and one day coming in glory? And I think Augustine shows us why that's not just a uniquely Christian problem. That's a human problem. Yeah having trouble living with that kind of tension. And it's not just a 21st century problem. It's a perennial problem. Yeah. He'll describe how in his day, Romans really struggled with the idea of either thinking Rome is just this nihilistic project that's worth not at all, or thinking Rome is glorious, perfect, delivering all the goods and being capable of acknowledging that it has remarkable blessings and also tragedy laden elements as well is something in their own day was a constant challenge for anyone providing leadership for anyone wanting to to seek the common good so you realize in all this that one of the crucial components of this is eschatology and mm -hmm. when you use that word eschatology immediately people start thinking about you know rapture prophecies they they want to get into those arguments but uh, broadening out from that and and obviously there are a lot of differences even among Bible believing evangelicals on that question but but broadening it out further eschatology is just where is this all headed what mm -hmm. is God's plan for this creation uh, and and resolving how we resolve that tension where we fall in the already the kingdom is already here and the kingdom is not yet here, how we resolve that tension accounts for a lot of those differences that we have in eschatology. But how important is it to have, you know, sort of a, a telos, a goal, an understanding of where we're all headed 
for the living in the here and now? Yeah, that's a great question, John. I think there's two things Augustine leads us to say. One would be when you get to the end of the work, as elsewhere, he points out, understandably, we're on something of a limited basis knowing what glory hereafter is going to be like because it is so startlingly different Mm -hmm. from what we catch on the evening news. (laughs) And so unlike almost any other topic, the two things most hard to understand are life before fall and life and glory because they're unlike in stark ways what we experience here and now. So he says there are a lot of details God apparently doesn't see fit to tell us now. At the same time, he says just what you're suggesting, knowing God's promise is of utmost significance for living today. Early on when he's describing how Christians have actually been great citizens and even the best leaders, Mm -hmm. he will turn to a a character, the Emperor Theodosius at the end of the fourth century as his highest example. And when he describes over a dozen characteristics that go into making a good emperor, or we might say a good leader, uh, he describes one who is happy in hope at every level. And happiness and hope, not in the present circumstance, but in that which is pledged to come, frees you to behave in ways that people need, but we're fearful to offer. Mm. So Theodosius isn't just a straightforward success. He does some terrible things. And his bishop, Ambrose of Milan, has to call him out for a vicious military campaign. That's horrific, even by the standards of that day, which is saying something. (laughs) But Theodosius does what emperors don't do. When he's called to repent before he comes to the Lord's table, he does so. It's a remarkable act of humility, of repentance, of acknowledging the fact that he is not the ultimate king and his is not the most definitive kingdom. It's, it's almost without parallel in that world. And he does that because he knows there's something greater coming. And so he's willing to humble himself in the moment. When he thinks about the way in which leaders ought to care for the needy or for the wayward, uh, to care about justice, to care about order and provision. Again and again, Augustine goes back similarly to the idea of being happy in hope, knowing that we have a sure and certain future, as First Peter will put it, it provides a living hope. And that actually transforms the way we live and the way even we lead today. So eschatology is crucial. We may not know exactly how to paint the picture of what a day in glory will look like. We know the center of it will involve being with God. It will involve newness. It will be absent sin and sadness and sorrow. Uh, And those are plenty enough for us to have resolve and thus to have courage for sacrifice and for love. Yeah, biblical perspective of the future gives us a good biblical perspective of the here and now Mm -hmm. and how to exist as citizens of that great city of God uh, that is inaugurated, but not fully consummated. In just the same way that anybody thinking about finance and investment, if they're uncertain about the future, they hold back their capital. It's a great analogy. But when you have confidence, Mm. that's precisely when money flows and that's when the market moves. Similarly, when we think about our hope with God. Yeah. That, that's super helpful. Switching gears briefly, um, in addition to being the academic dean at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida, you also are professor of systematic theology. Mm-hmm. Our listeners might not have the foggiest idea of what it means to teach systematic theology. Uh, you've committed your life and your career to it. So explain briefly, what is systematic theology and why does it matter? Yeah, the, the shortest way to describe it would be simply to say that when we talk about doing theology systematically or pursuing systematic theology, the idea is not simply to say, what's one interesting belief we get from one particular passage? Or what's one question that we might be led to ask today or in this season? It's always to step back and to connect the dots and to take in as best we can the whole picture. Uh, We live in a day and an age where we tend to focus intensely on details and minutia. We think atomistically, we break things down. And that makes sense. I mean, we can only focus on so much, but it's crucial always to ask the big questions, not just what does Genesis mean, but how does that relate to Revelation? Not just what does Jesus say and do in the gospels, but how's that the fulfillment of the Old Testament? Uh, Not just how do I preach the gospel, but also 
what's involved in making disciples and teaching all that Jesus has commanded. And systematic theology is simply a, a set of protocols or practices to keep us honest and to keep us asking those big questions constantly. You can always only read one verse or think about one idea at a time, but you can be inclining yourself to continue asking well, what else does that connect to? What other questions does that raise? What other biblical passages are crucial context for that idea? And, and systematic theology is meant to help provide that broader vantage point. Maybe a way to describe it would be to give you that wide angle lens. It's crucial to be able to zoom in, catch the detail, the color, the nuance in one small bit of a picture, but to be able to widen out that frame, to be able to see its context and appreciate where it fits, that's the role of systematic theology. Do you find that sometimes people are f afraid of it? And I don't mean from the sense of it being daunting, though it ought to be when we realize we're looking at a holy God here, but from the standpoint of God being a, a, a subject of, of study strikes some evangelicals as sort of a wrong idea from the get-go. Oh, you're trying to put God in a box. Oh, you're trying to limit God. Oh, you're replacing faith with this study of, of, of doctrine. Um, do you find that people are afraid of it? And what's, what's your response? Response to that. Yeah, that's a that's a common intuition, sometimes voiced, sometimes just felt, mm -hmm. but not given voice. I think it's understandable in many respects. And I would say there are a lot of systematic theologians out there for whom that would be an accurate description, and I wouldn't <laughs> wish it upon my worst enemy. Mm. Uh, that said, I, I think the reality, if we're going to be honest and candid and turn the mirror on ourselves, is we're all inclined to put God in a box. Mm. That's the problem. And actually, systematic theology is no guaranteed solution, but it is a set of intentional protocols that help you actually target that. We're inclined to think, I know what love means or grace. I know what goodness is or righteousness. We tend to bring that from our culture, from our personal experience. Justice as well. And to we're talking all about sorts that. of yeah. categories just like that. And we read it into the Bible. Systematic theology can't guarantee you won't do that. We're, we're good at being idolaters, of course, <laughs> but it does raise a series of questions that keep you honest and ought to help more often than not so that you're asking, okay, where's that definition coming from? Where do I have assumptions that are actually prejudices and biases that are distorting the way I hear God's word? In what regard am I actually putting God in a box? And, and in reality imaging him poorly. And so I would actually suggest it's just the opposite. Again and again and again in church history, we see heretics sleep well at night. And, and what I mean by that is they interpret scripture. They're almost always Bible people quoting passages mm -hmm. left and right. That's how they gain a Christian following for a time. But what they do is they always straighten out what seems challenging by by reading it through what they think is common sense, but it's not God's sense. And it winds up leading them to deny this passage for the sake of saying that one. Mm. And eventually we realize, well, they're not presenting the whole counsel of God. Systematic theology is just broadening it out. It's saying the Bible calls us to believe some mysterious, challenging things. Jesus is God and human. God is three and one. I mean, these are mysterious. They speak of a transcendent being. They're not like when you meet another friend on the street. God is holy, holy, holy. And so he is challenging to think about. And systematic theology helps us always remember that and to practice patience, care, and hopefully a good dose of humility. Mike, I've had the privilege of knowing you for several decades, and yep. so it's a joy when I get to travel the country and I run into one of your former students, which happens all the time. It's amazing. And one of the things they tell me is by far you were one of their favorite professors. And one of the things I remember one student telling me about a year ago was that you made theology come alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, you help them to see the relevance of theology for all of life. Explain to us, how do you do that in the classroom? There mm -hmm. might be some people listening go, they hear the word, even the word theology, they think dull and mundane and boring and rote, but mm -hmm. how do you make it come alive and help your student connect the dots between what you're teaching out of the textbook mm -hmm. and their own pastoral ministry and, and life? Yeah. 
You know, I think there's a couple things that all of us doing this are trying to work at and to lead folks into. One would be to say, thinking matters. Mm. I mean, the great commandment that Jesus leads us to is love the Lord your God in total devotion with all you are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that involves more than the life of the intellect, but it does involve the intellect. And the intellect, it is shaped by other things, but it also shapes and informs how we go about what we go about. And so one thing is just convincing people the life of the mind matters. And we live in a pragmatic age Mm -hmm. and in many ways an anti-intellectual society. And that's a real go for everybody, not just Christians. The other would be to say, we've got to convince people, not just tell them, but show them with some force that the Bible actually informs and illumines a really vibrant life of the mind. And there's a lot of people, Augustine was one of them in his own day. He was a long and slow convert. He had a Christian mom, pagan dad, and he was much more on dad's side until well into young adulthood. And one of the many reasons was he thought the Bible was lame. He'd read Greek and Roman literature. It went high and lofty and dealt with big things. And then God promises Abraham this small portion of the Middle East, which no Roman thought was great real estate. Yeah. So Augustine had to be sold on the idea over years that the Bible actually really addressed the life of the mind and great hopes uh, and big questions in a powerful way. And we've got to show people that how the Bible really does touch on all the big questions. It's not that we don't need other books. We don't need scientists. We don't need philosophers. We, we need the other sure. gifts God provides. But the Bible does provide this remarkable grid, as you said, where there's a lens for viewing things. Uh, one great student of, of Augustine is John Calvin, and he describes scripture as a set of, he uses a term we'd probably render spectacles, but we would say lenses, a set of lenses for viewing the world. And the, his point there is you're going to see the world, you're going to see yourself. And if you're not being helped by God's lens, you're going to see it in a distorted way. Think about how often we view something and and we misperceive and thus we act foolishly, maybe sometimes painfully because we misjudged a situation. We didn't know what was really going on. Uh, Calvin argues you're going to constantly be doing that with God unless you're increasingly convinced and competent to view it through the, the lenses of scripture. And that just That just takes again and again going to each and every sort of portion or genre of scripture and showing how it's meant to equip. It's meant to build up. It's meant to form us. We got great examples, Calvin himself, Augustine, women and men around the globe today through the ages. It's a joy and a privilege to get to study them and introduce them to men and women studying today. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I think about what's happening in the 21st century church today. And I would go as far, you know, throughout the ages, there's always been the debate of whether Christians should engage culture or not. I always tell our people, you're engaging culture, whether you realize it or yeah, not. Well, we do it well or yeah, badly. Yeah, well, well or badly. And I, I think, you know, to, re- to retreat from theology, to retreat from raising your children with a biblical worldview and a firm foundation, if there was ever a time we needed to double down on mm-hmm. theology, double down on giving our children. uh, catechizing our children and raising them up with that theological framework for the world, it's now. It's certainly not a time to reverse (laughs) what we've seen kind of practiced in church history well. It's it's now a time to re-engage. The yeah. mind, as, you as, said. as a kid, as you know, I, I lived first for over a decade in the deep south in the Bible Belt and then moved and, and lived in South Florida in Miami, where church attendance already at that time was massively low. Mm. And uh, it's fascinating to observe the difference from a very Christian literate society to a f- society lacking Christian fluency in many ways. And that's the one, as you're describing, that needs theology. It even needs systematic theology for missionary purposes, because words just don't make sense in the same way. Even a sentence like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, simply doesn't communicate to a random person unless there's a set of categories about what love means um, that, that make that a gift and not a rather beside the point statement. So we really do need to challenge the church. We need to equip them precisely because in so many respects, we are in a more post-Christian and less biblically literate 
setting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, Mike, grateful for your friendship, partnership in this kingdom work, uh, grateful for the work that you're doing up in Orlando. And uh, we'll definitely have you back uh, to talk more about incredible topics like we've talked about today. But uh, thank you for being a guest on the City of God podcast. Always great to be with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the City of God podcast and our interview with Dr. Michael Allen of Reformed Theological Seminary. As always, if there is someone that would benefit from listening or watching this episode of the City of God, uh, please feel free to pass it along to them. We are weekly together exploring today's biggest cultural issues all through the lens of God's infallible word. We pray that you would tune in next week. And until then, may God richly bless you. The City of God podcast is produced by Coral Ridge Ministries and made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. Visit us at cityofgodpodcast.com to access all of our previous episodes. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or anywhere you get podcasts. A full video version of this podcast is available on YouTube. This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture.